Dear doctors, so today I'm going to discuss about the MRCP PACES consultation station and I'm going to talk about the case of Parkinsonism. I got a feedback from the candidates and this case uh, appear frequently in your MRCP uh, PACES uh, consultation station and it can also appear in the neurology station as well. So it's important to know about this case very well because this is uh, an easy case and you should know inside out of this case to get the good marks. So let's start our uh, presentation. So this is the uh, scenario and as I've told you before that uh, in MRCP PACES consultation station you'll get a brief scenario and uh, while you, you got this scenario you have some time to think about the scenario so it's a good time to uh, get your thoughts organized and think about all the differential diagnosis and what are the points you're going to talk in the history. Maybe you can just um, write it on a piece of paper and you're allowed to bring that piece of paper with you uh, in the consultation station. So scenario is you're a junior doctor in a neurology clinic and uh, Mrs. Johnson has come for consultation. She's a 65 year old woman and this, she has been referred by GP for evaluation of tremors and difficulty in movement. So we have to, our task is to take a focus history, do the examination and address any patient concerns. So as in, as I told you before in my presentation, the first important thing is introduction. So we're going to introduce, you're going to introduce yourself and you're going to explain your role. We obviously ensure a comfortable environment for the patient and we have to establish the rapport and reassure uh, Mrs. Johnson. So you can introduce yourself by saying something like this, that I am the doctor, whatever is, whatever is the name, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the doctor who is working here. And today I'm going to talk a bit about your symptoms and would like to do some uh, focus examination. So just take the consent. Then going to open the communication. So begin with an open-ended question and to allow the patient to describe their symptoms in their own words. Uh, this is a very important part of the history taking because uh, usually the patient or if there is not a patient, maybe an actor also, they will give all the information in one go which they are allowed to give without, um, without any prompt from you. So very important that you should ask this question. So something along the lines, can you tell me about what brought you to the clinic today okay so then we're going to move on and we're going to ask about some onset time progression about the symptoms you the patient will give you some uh, history maybe he's disturbed about the tremors or whatever it is then going to ask about the onset and progression so explore the onset and progression of symptoms when did you first notice the symptoms and can you describe how they have changed or progressed over time? Remember that do rehearsal of these lines and keep it as natural as possible and you should go with you know, the flow of consultation uh, should be good. If the patient has mentioned about the tremors, like in this case already we know that patient has resting tremors. We, if the patient has already told you, it's okay. If the patient didn't tell you anything about tremors, then you can ask about, do you notice any shaking or tremors, especially when you are at rest? Then we're going to, if the patient gives you history of tremors and by looking at the patient, you think that patient has Parkinsonism, then we're going to ask all the relevant questions about the Parkinsonism. So we're going to ask about the stiffness and rigidity. So, so you can say something, have you experienced any stiffness or difficulty moving certain parts of your body? We're going to explore about the bradykinesia as well. So this is how we're going to ask. Have you noticed any slowness in your movements like difficulty getting up from a chair or performing everyday tasks? So remember that all these are very, very important points uh, in the history. And usually in the consultation station, the examiner is there the whole time and is closely observing you how you are progressing your history. We're going to talk a bit about the postural instability. So we're going to ask, 
have you had any issues with balance especially when standing or walking and then once we have all the symptoms if the positive symptoms of parkinson's and we are we are satisfied they taken all the relevant history then we're going to jump to the family history we're going to inquire about a family history of neurological disorder is there any history of similar conditions in your family such as parkinson's disease or other neurological disorders medication history is very important so can you provide a list of all the medications you are currently taking including any supplements now this is very important because sometimes we miss this one always ask about any supplements or over the counter medications normally the patient will give you the list or if they are taking just two or three medicine they'll tell you the name so go just if you they give you the list take some time to look at the list and uh, see uh, specifically what medicines patient is taking and if there's any interaction or anything wrong with it the prescription that you can discuss in the end then impacts on daily life so understand how symptoms affect daily life uh, how have these symptoms affected your ability to carry out your daily activities uh, these questions are you will ask in any long case any history you have to ask about the impact on daily life any additional symptoms explore any other relevant changes like any cognitive changes any sleep disturbances or autonomic symptoms we going to talk about the psychological aspects as well so consider consider the impact on the patient's quality of life and any psychological factors uh, how are you feeling emotionally about these symptoms and this is uh, important questions and must ask in almost all the uh, consultation station any previous investigations or treatment ask if ms jones ms johnson has undergone any previous investigations or treatment related to her symptoms now remember this this history just in the exam be confident and be calm and try to cover as many points as possible so once you have done your history then you remember that in addressing the patient concern in a case of uh, the suspecting uh, suspected parkinson it's important to employ clear communication and empathy empathy must be shown although this is a consultation station and you may think that history physical examination is important but showing empathy is equally important so acknowledge and validate so start by acknowledging mrs johnson concern and validating her feelings you can say something along lines i understand that experience these symptoms can be distressing it's important for us to discuss your concern so that we can work to work together to find the best approach this is just an example anything which works for you you can uh, just which you are comfortable uh, you can say explanation of parkinsonism so provide a clear and simple explanation of parkinsonism based on our assess- assessment it seems that you may be experiencing symptoms consistent with parkinsonism this is a neurological condition that involves certain changes in movement i want to assure you that we will work together to understand and manage these symptoms again this is just example whatever statement works for you but remember that you have to um, acknowledge first uh, whatever the patient is experiencing and then you have to be, give the explanation of the um, uh, likely diagnosis further investigation so we will going to explain the need for additional investigation to confirm the diagnosis and guide treatment so as you can say something like that, like this to provide a more precise diagnosis and tailor our approach we we may need to conduct further investigations such as imaging or laboratory tests and this will help us understand the underlying cause of your symptoms and then management option so discuss the available uh, management options including medications and lifestyle medication uh, lifestyle modifications fortunately fortunately there are treatment options available to manage the symptoms and these may include medications that can improve movement and lifestyle adjustment we'll discuss these in more detail based on your specific needs then we have to address the lifestyle impact acknowledge the impact on daily life and address how management strategies can help i recognize that these symptoms may be affecting your daily life as part of our plan we will explore way to minimize the impact on your activities and enhance your overall well-being and then we have to uh, give the open communication so encourage mr johnson to share any specific concerns or questions she may have i want this to be a collaborative process so please feel free to share any questions or concerns 
you might have and your input is vital in tailoring our approach to meet your needs. Obviously, we need a supportive uh, environment and we have to emphasize the support available throughout the diagnostic and treatment process. And we can say something like this, you are not alone in this, we'll work together as a team and I encourage you to involve your family or any support system you may have. Regular follow-ups will also allow us to monitor your progress and make any necessary adjustment to the plan. And finally, the informed consent. Ensure that the patient, in this case Mrs. Johnson, understands and consents the proposed investigations and treatment. So before we proceed, with any tests or treatment, I will explain everything in detail and will make decision together. Your understanding and agreements are essential every step of the way. Okay, so here, here is it. Uh, remember that once you, if the if the uh, prompt say that you have to acknowledge and you have to explain. So remember these points. First of all, I'll repeat again: acknowledge and validate acknowledge and validate then explanation of the disease in this parkinsonism we're going to tell a bit about the further investigations talk about the management options addressing the lifestyle impact and open communication and finally we tell them about the support and the informed consent Okay, let's move on and talk a bit about the the examination. So, how's here's an approach to examination and uh, potential findings. First of all, uh, you're going to look at the patient, observe the patient face for any asymmetry or lack of expression, and ask the patient to smile frown and show their teeth. In, in, in the examination, it is very important to give some commentary as well. So uh, you can take the consent from the patient once you have completed your uh, uh, examination. Then you are going, going to um, uh, take the consent and do the running commentary as well. Okay, um, I like to examine you. Uh, okay, I am going to look at your face now. So. Observe the patient face for any asymmetry or lack of expression. Then we're going to do the eye movements. So here we are looking at the um, eye movements like in the third, uh, fourth and sixth. So assess any um, extraocular movements by asking the patient to follow your fingers through the cardinal direction of gaze and check for any, any nystagmus. Then we're going to move on to motor examination. We're going to do a check for the resting tremors. So ask the patient to relax their arms and observe for any resting tremors, which are a common feature of a, a Parkinsonism. So here you can see that uh, you can here you can see some resting tremors. We can also ask the patient to outstretch the hand, and then we can we can see some resting tremors here also. Then going to in the motor examination, do the rigidity. Test for rigidity by gently moving the patient limbs passively at the joints, feeling for resistance. Typically, cogwheel or lead pipe rigidity may be present. Uh, bradykinesia. Assess bradykinesia by having the patient perform rapid alternating movements such as tapping their fingers or pronating and supinating their hands. And then we are going to check for any postural stability. So evaluate postural stability by asking the patient to stand with their feet together and uh, then with one foot in front of the other the tandem stance and note any instability or sway and we're going to check the gait, observe the patient gait, look for a shuffling walk, reduce arm strings and hesitation in initiating steps and finally find motor skills, assess the motor skill by having the patient pick up small objects or manipulate buttons. So remember that now this is uh, so we have to be a focused examination. So once you have done the face examination you have some idea about the Nerves, you're going to do the motor examination in detail, specifically to the Parkinsonism like resting tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability and gait. Then we're going to check for reflexes as well. Um, that's the deep tendon reflexes, particularly the bicep, tricep, and knee reflexes. 
and then uh, we'll move on to sensory examination. We know that Parkinson it primarily uh, affects motor function, but a brief sensory examination is still necessary to allow, rule out other potential causes of symptoms. We're going to do the coordination. So evaluate coordination through tests such as finger to nose test and heel to shin test and observe the patient gait and balance during walking and turning and note any fascination or freezing of gait. Um, what potential findings, positive findings we may have in Parkinson, just a repetition, resting primer, especially in the hands, rigidity, which is resistance to passive movements with a jerky quality, bradykinesia, which is evident in slow movements, and difficulty with, with rapid alternating movements, postural instability with an increased risk of falls, shuffling gait, and mass-like facial expression and reduced blink rate. Uh, tremors, remember, they may decrease during voluntary movements, so they, that's why they refer to resting tremors. And we remember to tailor the examination to the patient needs and capabilities and always communicate your actions clearly to the patient throughout the process. So if any abnormality are found, they can guide further investigations and they can contribute to the formulation of diagnosis and management plan. So then once you have done your examination, then maybe you need to present the case. So that will, will come to the end. So what, what are the investigations which we like to do? The examiner, because, because of the time constraint, maybe the examiner will stop you there and they'll ask asking about the, they'll ask uh, some questions about the Parkinsonism. So once you have given the diagnosis, they, they may ask that, uh, what is your approach to investigations? So first of all, try to be uh, systematic. So we're going to do some blood test, CBC, to rule out any anemia or related conditions. We want to do the electrolytes level. We want to do the thyroid function test. In the imaging studies, brain imaging, MRI or CT scan, we want to assess for any structural abnormalities or other conditions that may mimic Parkinsonism. Um, now, ideally, the Parkinson, Parkinsonism does not show any structural abnormalities on imaging, but it's mainly to rule out uh, other potential causes. That scan, um, I did to evaluate the dopamine transporter level in the brain. So that is somehow helpful. In Parkinson, Parkinsonism, there is a reduction in dopamine and a DAT scan can visualize the dopamine level. It can aid in differentiating between Parkinson disease and other Parkinson, Parkinsonian syndromes. So that is the main idea of doing the DAT scan. And here you can see the dead scan here. Uh, just for the so you, you can see there is some uh, uh, the superior shape, so possible Parkinsonian syndrome. And we have here a comma shape, which is uh, possible essential tremors. Lumbar puncture, we should mention that we can do the lumbar puncture, maybe may, be, may be considered in certain cases to rule out inflammatory or infectious causes. Elevated pro, pro, uh, protein level without an increase in white blood cell can be seen in some Parkinsonian syndromes. Genetic testing, purpose to identify specific genetic mutations associated with familial forms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, indication strong family history of Parkinson and early onset of symptoms. Then functional imaging, SPECT or PET scan can be to assess the dopamine level. And PET imaging with a Rio tracer like uh, fluorodopa can provide information on dopamine synthesis and storage. Uh, it's almost the same thing like that scan. And then um, um, uh, EEG to rule out condition that you may present with movement disorders like seizures and sleep studies um, because sleep disturbances are common in and a sleep study may be helpful. And then other specialized tests like autonomic uh, function tests to assess for autonomic dysfunction, um, which can occur in certain Parkinsonian syndromes. Neuropsychological testing, um, this can help evaluate the cognitive function and identify any associated cognitive improvement. So remember that uh, if you can remember few of these uh, tests should be enough the important one is doing the basics starting with the basics like lab, lab, blood test imaging studies to rule out any other potential causes that scan in some cases you know, csf uh, analysis genetic testing functional imaging eeg sleep studies depending on how how what are you thinking 
So the remember that the choice of investigations should be guided by the clinical presentation and the need to rule out secondary causes that may mimic Parkinsonism. So consultation with a neurologist is essential to interpret the results and formula on appropriate management plan. Diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, it is primarily clinical and investigations are used to support clinical findings rather than establish the diagnosis. Always consider the individual patient characteristics and comorbidities when deciding on and interpreting investigation. The result of these tests combined with the clinical examination will contribute to a comprehensive diagnostic picture and guide further management. The examiner may ask you what are your management options. So here you have to be again systematic. So remember that the management it involves a multidisciplinary approach and this is in almost all the cases now that we need a multidisciplinary tool and is tailored to the individual patient's symptoms and needs and the primary aim is to improve the patient's quality of life. We want to alleviate the symptoms and provide support. So how should be the uh, general management approach? There are some medications which could be helpful. Just remember the names like liver dopa. This is most effective for elevating the motor symptoms. These are often combined with carbidopa to prevent peripheral conversion of liver dopa before it reaches the brain. We have an option of dopamine agonist like uh, primipexol and propanolol and other mimics the action of dopamine in the brain. We have MOB inhibitor, monoamine oxidase B inhibitors like selegiline which help prevent the breakdown of dopamine and we have scomped inhibitors, catechol or methyl transferase inhibitors and we have tolcapon which prolongs the effects of liver dopa by inhibiting the breakdown. No need to go in the details of this, just mention about the medication, if you mention about the medication name is enough because your answer should cover not only the medications, mainly we are talking about the multidisciplinary approach, so it should cover everything. Then the physical therapy, um, regular exercises including aerobic and resistance training can help improve mobility and balance and occupational therapy, focus on maintaining independence in daily activities and addressing the fine motor skills. Sometimes we need a help from the speech therapy as well, can help manage speech and swallowing difficulties. Supportive therapies like uh, nutritional support and if the patient has got swallowing difficulties, occupational and recreational therapy, support in maintaining, maintaining engagement in enjoyable activities. Assistive uh, devices, walking aids, which can help with the balance and mobility. Adoptive devices, tools and devices to aid in, in activity of daily living. We need the psychological support for the patient, counseling and support groups. So, and these can provide the emotional support and a platform for sharing experiences. Psychiatric support, address any mental health concern that may arise. And some cases, maybe we have to do surgical interventions, which includes option include deep brain stem stimulation. In cases where medications are not providing sufficient relief, DBS may be considered and electrodes are implanted in specific areas of brain to modulate abnormal nerve signals. Regular follow-up is essential, monitoring and adjustment, so regular appointment with a neurologist for monitoring symptoms and adjusting medication as needed and assessment of treatment response and potential side effects. Education is important, educate the patient about and their caregivers about the condition, about the treatment options and their strategies for managing symptoms and potential complications. And participation in clinical trials may be an option, especially in cases where standard treatments are not providing sufficient relief. And end-of-life care in advanced stages, palliative and hospice care may be needed to manage symptoms and provide support for both the patient and their family. So it is important to note that uh, the management plan should be individualized, taking into consideration the patient overall health, the comorbidities and preferences. So regular communication and collaboration between the patient, their caregivers and the healthcare team are crucial for optimizing care and addressing evolving needs over time. So when a patient, remember, it presents with symptoms suggestive of Parkinsonism, it's crucial to consider a broad range of potential differential diagnosis. Uh, Parkinsonism is a clinical syndrome and we know it is characterized by tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity and postural uh, uh, instability. So sometimes the patient may ask, uh, the sorry, the examiner may ask that what are the other differential diagnoses? So I have put some differential diagnoses here. Uh, Parkinson's disease, which this is an idiopathic Parkinson's disease, is the most common cause of Parkinsonism and we know that it's a neurodegenerative order and is characterized by loss of dopamine producing neurons in substantia nigra. 
Then we have Parkinson plus syndrome in, in which we have multiple system atrophy MSA and this is characterized by autonomic dysfunctions like cerebellar taxia and Parkinson features. Uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, patient with postural instability, vertical gaze palsy and falls and corticobasal syndrome which involves asymmetric rigidity, apraxia and cortical sensory loss. Drug-induced Parkinson, certain medications like uh, antipsychotics, haloperidol can induce Parkinson symptoms. Vascular Parkinson, which are caused by multiple small strokes affecting the basal ganglia or other parts of the brain involved in motor control. Toxic metabolic causes like Wilson disease, um, which leads to copper accumulation, hydrocephalus, increased pr uh, pressure on the brain, um, uh, CSF pressure, hypothyroidism, low thyroid only can cause Parkinsonian symptoms. And then we have infectious causes, CJD, Crossfield Jacob disease, which is a prion disease, rapid progression and variety of neurological symptoms and encephalitis. Huntington disease, uh, we know that it is a genetic disorder and got motor dysfunction, cognitive decline and psychiatric symptoms. Structural lesions, um, any tumor or any other structural abnormalities in the brain, it can, which affects the basal ganglia or lateral structural essential tremors. Um, but these tremors are particularly during the voluntary movements. And psychogenic movement disorders that are not due to neurological disease, but they have psychological origin. Dopamine receptor blocking agent. Certain agents we already talk about antipsychotics or antiemetics can lead to Parkinson syndrome and leave it body dementia. And this is different because you got cognitive decline, visual hallucinations and motor symptoms, which are similar to Parkinson's disease. So remember that it's important to conduct a thorough clinical evaluation, including a detailed history, neurological examination, appropriate investigation to narrow down the potential causes and arrive at an accurate diagnosis. So collaboration with the neurologist or movement disorder specialist is often essential for a comprehensive assessment. So I've run through these uh, differential diagnoses. Um, um, this is a very important question. Uh, so must, uh, must remember this. Um, just try to remember broad group it in uh, group the, these differential diagnoses and then uh, it will be easy to remember. So I'll just repeat once again because it's very important. Remember about the Parkinson disease, Parkinson plus syndrome, drug induced Parkinsonism, vascular Parkinsonism, toxic metabolic causes, infectious causes, Huntington disease, structural lesions, essential tremors, and Levy body dementia. So try to remember all this. I think today's presentation is a bit long. Thank you very much, my dear doctors, and I'll see you in my next presentation.